elsewhere in other videos that Labyrinth is my favorite film. Nay, it is the most important film to me personally. It is both creatively inspiring and perennially motivating. It's one of the first films I remember seeing, and the second time I saw it, I was Sarah's age. It's been a huge part of my fan development, art, and life. So huge, writing a comprehensive video on the subject has taken up most of its 29th, 30th, and 31st anniversaries, and then certain glittering princes had to return to their home among the stars and complicate things. But alas, here we are a few years late and in desperate need of some dance magic dance and our kingdoms to be as great. So, here we go. I was in a limousine with Jim Henson and my wife Wendy and I had this strong image of the baby surrounded by goblins. So fresh off the heels of ambitious passion project Dark Crystal, Jim Henson and artist Brian Froud wanted to collaborate on another fantasy. First image that came to Brian's mind was that of a child surrounded by goblins. And he said, why don't we set it in a labyrinth? That's a good place for transformation. And Jim said, yeah, let's go with that. He wanted to make a fairy tale for his daughter, so the hero became a teenage girl. Jim and Brian banged out the outline of what they wanted together, while Froud drew enough goblins to fill a labyrinth. Now, Dark Crystal amounted to a very pretty experiment, and Henson wanted to act on some of the lessons he learned from said experiment. He wanted humans back on set so the audience could better relate to the main characters. Jim also wanted to retain the fantasy of Dark Crystal, but bring back the humor so prevalent in the Muppets. So he got Monty Python Terry Jones to give the script a humorous punch-up. Jones would essentially rifle through Froud's sketches and write scenes, giving us some of the film's most memorable moments, like the Wise Man and the Fireys. After a few more drafts and some input from their producer, George Hero's Journey consultant Lucas, they were ready to start shooting. They always wanted a rock star to play Jareth and lucked out getting their first pick with David Bowie, though Michael Jackson and Sting were on the shortlist. David brought his music to the table as well as himself, and for Sarah, they found a young actress named Jennifer Connelly to take on the lead role. For all its pedigree, Labyrinth did not do incredibly well at the box office. Though, like Wizard of Oz before it, it gained traction in syndication. And a small and fearsomely dedicated fan base has been growing ever since. Many of my fellow fangirls describe a similar introduction to Labyrinth. They caught the movie on TV or at Blockbuster and were pleasantly surprised by its weirdness and heart. Afterward, they did some digging on the internet, curious if this 30-year-old niche flop had any kind of fan community after all this time. Most were pleasantly surprised by the deluge of art, fanfic, and the existence of a tight-knit community. Labyrinth is unique in that it's a coming-of-age adventure film centered around a female protagonist. Most memorable coming-of-age stories set to celluloid center around prepubescent boys. They're so memorable, they continued into the 90s and reached long enough to have their own nostalgia throwback period. Memorable female-centered coming-of-age adventure films are far less prevalent. Most are what I call slumber party films. They center around a girl in high school who wants the attentions of an arbitrary guy, or to get to the top of a completely arbitrary social status. And the antagonist is another girl who arbitrarily lords herself over the protagonist, and none of these arbitrary things are ever questioned or challenged within that narrative. Wait, Mean Girls did deconstruct it, but that was kind of the point. My point is that Labyrinth is a rare breed and how it uses a fantastic symbolic adventure and approaches it from a distinctly female perspective. Only a handful of properties do this, and they are in a genre tailor-made for me. So if you know of any more, let me know. 
It's based on a lot of mythological motifs, which I know quite a bit about. Labyrinth is built on the structure of the hero's journey. For an excellent resource on how closely the film follows Joseph Campbell's template, I recommend Sir Sam Ursa's well done video series on the subject. I am more going to hit the high points before diving straight into deep folklore. Sarah begins the story in the real world, playing make-believe and generally wishing people would understand her better. Then she wishes her baby brother away to the goblins. Interesting factor is that Sarah's mistake is the inciting incident, but her decision to run the labyrinth is her answer to the call. She refuses her own call by wishing Toby away in the first place, but immediately seeks to do everything to set things right. Here's another ambiguous part of the cycle, because the first people Sarah meets after accepting her quest are Hoggle and Jareth. Hoggle plays the traditional mentor, dispensing wisdom, providing Sarah opportunities to grow. Jareth, however, is a shadow mentor as much as an antagonist. He sets challenges for Sarah to resist and then consequently learn. So she enters the labyrinth, comes across obstacles, and has to parse friend from foe. Sarah gets stuck in an oubliette, but convinces Hoggle to let her out through persistence and cunning. Though as Sarah gets closer to the center of the labyrinth, Jareth gives her an enchanted peach through Hoggle that sends her into a roofy fever dream of being a princess at a debauched ball. Sarah does not want that nonsense, so she smashes the bubble and falls into a junk heap, forgetting everything. Then a sentient scrap pile leads her to a simulacrum of her bedroom, making her think it was all a dream. No lie, when I was four, this scene terrified me. I kept thinking, this can't be that simple. There's something wrong. Sarah's forgetting something. She's in danger. And thought so. And even today, this scene still squicks me out the most. More than oubliettes, cleaners, and vaguely intimidating explorations of sexuality within drugged out dreams, the junk scene feels like the biggest threat. And I think it's because it explores the dangers of regression, even the dangers of nostalgia. Sarah's compelled to forget all but the whoobies that made her superficially happy. She forgets the baby and her new friends and her entire life beyond that room. It's stagnation for Sarah and the people depending on her. And stagnation isn't comfort, it's death. But Sarah realizes this herself, stating it's all junk and storming off to the castle. Then everything until the final confrontation with Jareth feels narratively like a cakewalk. She's already won emotionally by the time she gets to the Escher room. All that remains is proving it to her antagonist. She says the immortal words, you have no power over me. The clock strikes 13 and Sarah gets to go home with baby brother and on-demand goblin parties in tow. Cool, great, we've covered the structure. Tale as old as time. But I want to delve a little deeper. You know, fairies and elves and that world of fantasy is a real world in terms of there's a lot written about it, there's been a lot done about it, there's been a lot of mythology created around it. Labyrinth was built in a far older tradition than most conventional fairy tales. Disney mostly drew from the well of Charles Perrault sanitizing the brothers Grimm. And princesses considered in those fairy tales tend to follow a certain type. The idea of Cinderella and Snow White is that those heroines are so pure and good that the universe itself finds a way to undo the machinations of their stepmothers. Sarah is not that. She is an active heroine who starts with a grave mistake and spends the rest of the film working to undo her damage. Active heroines as protagonists hail from a deeper vein of folklore, a vein Brian Froud, human folklore encyclopedia, and actual believer in fairies knows well. He would be very familiar with Sarah's many sisters, there's the story of the witch's house, older than dirt, but commonly given to Baba Yaga. A forlorn stepdaughter is sent to the house of a witch. She is kind to the animals and fiends she meets along the way, and in turn they help her escape the witch's clutches. There's East of the Sun, West of the Moon, a variant of Beauty and the Beast or Cupid and Psyche. A prince transfigured as a bear takes a peasant girl for a wife before a troll queen snatches him away, and the girl must travel to an impossible castle to take back who was stolen from her. More recently, Sarah shares very much in common with the poem Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti. Two sisters pass by some strange men bearing strange fruit. One sister gives in to temptation and wastes away. The other has to contend with the goblins in a more hostile light in order to save her. 
Another similar example is the Maurice Sendak book Outside Over There, which has a cameo in the film itself. In this book, a young girl's infant sister is stolen by goblins when she isn't looking. She has to gather her wits and courage and confuse the goblins until dawn and win back her sister. And the well of folklore goes even deeper from there. There's also the title and principal setting of a labyrinth. A labyrinth, of course, calls to mind the Greek myth, with all its themes of vanquishing an impossible monster, solving puzzles, and a returning monarch coming into their throne. But that's not our only source of inspiration. Traditionally, a maze and a labyrinth are two separate things. A maze has multiple paths, dead ends, and choices to make. A labyrinth has only one path, though it twists, turns, and switches back on its inexorable way to the center. But there's no guarantee you'll ever get out again. A labyrinth also has spiritual significance. Traversing the winding path is considered a way to find the self or commune closer to God. It is a world of transformation and introspection, a metaphorical pilgrimage, but its uses predate Middle Age religion. It's been theorized in pre-Christian Europe, labyrinths were used for dances and pagan rituals and as a trap for prankish spirits. <laughs> Wonder how that's relevant. Goblins themselves already have a reputation for mischief. They are often depicted as unruly house spirits, the things you blame if the bread burns or you stub your toe. But they often fill roles in stories originally cast by the fair folk. These stories are a little more dire. They would kidnap babies and switch them with changelings, or a stone, or nothing. They would take women as nursemaids for their own babies and send them back without any memory of where they'd been once their task was complete. And sometimes they'd also kidnap young women, as brides. But largely within the film of Labyrinth, they are unfettered nuisances. They are pawns and cannon fodder for the real antagonist to throw in front of Sarah to slow her down and discourage her. Like so many egg avatars. Why don't you want to debate on a public platform, you fragging snowflake? The goblins aren't the only snarl Jareth puts in Sarah's way now. Like most traditional folkloric journeys, there are riddles to solve. From the deceptively straightforward... Up or down. ...to ancient tests of wit. But then one of us always tells the truth, and one of us always lies. There is no forcing one's way to the center of the labyrinth. This is not about getting your way, but finding your way. Sarah is constantly having to find out her right questions to ask and the right solutions to the puzzles. That is, if she can keep from being cocky about it. This is a piece of cake! One of the most mythological obstacles our heroine faces is Jareth's peach. Hoggle gives it to her when she's tired, hungry, and apt to be unsuspicious. The poison works quickly, transporting her soul and possibly body into a soap bubble dream world. Inside is a decadent, depraved mockery of Cinderella's ball. Jareth is there, pursuing her even as she tries to find him in her delirium. Much like the scene, many folktales exist about hapless mortals finding themselves dancing in fairy rings or stumbling upon banquets. The cardinal rule among all these tales is to not eat the food. Those who eat the food of the fairies must stay bound to them forever or waste away, unable to eat human food again. That's how they keep you, and it goes all the way back to Hades, Persephone, and that darn pomegranate. I'd like to mention most of my analysis isn't revelatory, groundbreaking stuff. Some of the best literature I've ever read has been labyrinth fanfic that casts Jareth as this lord of the underworld or literal Satan. I'll link my faves in the doodly doo. It will not be a list for innocent eyes, but I digress. Where do I segue? Jareth as the Goblin King is basically living like the, the overly flamboyant, fabulous rock star. We now turn from the labyrinth and her inhabitants to their king. May his glory ever be burned against the permanent of heaven. Yes, Jareth, king of the goblins, his royal majesty, is not a goblin in a narrative or folkloric sense, but something much darker. By admission of one of his creators, namely Brian Froud, Jareth was written as a tragically romantic character. So points to our shippers there. And visually, Jareth is everything a teenage girl might find alluring. There's quite a bit of Heathcliff and Rochester in him, that's obvious. 
But there's also the medieval knight, the 18th century dandy, the Victorian lord of the manor, James Dean, and yes, Virginia, even a glam rock star at the peak of his 80s decadence. You think those pants were accidentally that tight? No, my friend, that is by design. However, this is all Jareth the character removed from the story. Put into his proper narrative place, he becomes a little less a daydream and a little more a nightmare. His role is that of the tempter and the exacting arbiter of Sarah's foolish wish. His closest mythological cousin is most likely the Errol King. He's the king of the fairies in German or Danish legend. He is said to lead children to the land of death, and some say he is the leader of the wild hunt, but he is most famous for the poem bearing his name by Goethe and the song of that poem by Schubert. This is the same poem where he pursues a child ceaselessly, first tempting them, then killing the child, all while their guardian desperately tries to save them. There are also Irish legends of dashing fairy princes and poets who whisk human lovers away to parts unknown or simply leave their cold corpses behind. With that context, it is clear that at least one child is not walking away from this should Jareth win. Visually, there are clues to this darker tone as well. Beneath the glitter and jewels, there's leather, feathers, and bones. His seduction is that of stasis. Play with your toys and your costumes. And empty promises. It'll show you your dreams. David Bowie's own body contributes to his otherworldly nature as well. One of his pupils is permanently dilated due to a schoolyard fight as a teenager. And also at this time, he still had a particularly pronounced canine. The whole effect makes Bowie's Jareth seem predatory, almost feral. The Goblin King is also shown shapeshifting into the form of a barn owl, which has a rich, arcane history of its own. Owls in general have always been arbiters of wisdom, dreams, and transformation across the board. Owls were considered ill omens and signs of impending danger in Rome. They are associated with magic in the Middle East, eaters of children in Malaya, and eaters of mothers in China. They are departed souls in Romania, Poland, and some Native American folklore. In Wales, it's even believed you will hear an owl near the house when an unmarried girl loses her virginity. Okay. Barn owls especially were considered a sign of impending death in British culture, and across the British Isles they brought the thunderstorm on their wings. And Jareth opens and closes the movie as an owl. He is the bookend to Sarah's journey. Jareth is also the patriarchy. He is a king. Literal patriarchy. It's that thing that happens with girls at that age that the, who can pull off an illusion that they're an adult is then they end up with the struggle of what happens when an adult man starts to respond to you. I consider Labyrinth to be a perfect feminist gateway film. Long before Furiosa and Female Ghostbusters, Labyrinth was a film intent on empowering the decisions of teenage girls. The entirety of the plot is driven by Sarah's decision. It's Sarah's decision to wish away her brother and her decision to get him back. She decides which way to go and how to answer the riddles. She eats the peach. She pops the bubble. And the film treats those decisions with the importance and personal autonomy they deserve. Other characters might discount Sarah for being a teenage girl, but the story itself counts her decisions important enough to conquer a king. The labyrinth is structured like a gauntlet of tests and obstacles for Sarah to pass to reach her goal, and she does it in a way not common to classical heroes' journeys. Also, the classical hero taking the journey is usually a man. Yeah. Sarah is not only non-violent in her pursuit, her natural way of getting past challenges is to make friends with them, or at least use courtesy and cunning to turn the social interaction in her favor. This is not only a staple in dealing with the old-school capricious fair folk, but a staple for how many women are conditioned to interact with the world. To butter the wheels of their ambition with politeness is usually considered weak or womanish in the context of heroic pursuits. Heroes are supposed to win by conquering, but Sarah conquers by compassion. And that ends up aiding her quest in more ways than one. As she progresses through the labyrinth, she acquires more and more makeshift family, like in The Wizard of Oz, and this family unquestioningly defers to Sarah as their leader. It is interesting to note that almost every inhabitant of the labyrinth Sarah encounters, friend, foe, or indifferent, is explicitly coded male. The only female-coded goblins are the tiny fairy at the gates and Agnes the junk lady. 
Now, if you know your triple-faced goddesses, you'll notice we have a girl and we have a crone, leaving Sarah to fill out the middle moray. But depending on which face of Eve you're using, that can make her a maiden, a mother, or a lover. Or is she something else entirely? A warrior? A queen? An argument could be made that chauvinistic having Sarah chase after a baby, you know, stereotypical role of caregiver. But Toby as a character doesn't really pop up that often. He's a MacGuffin. It's all really about Sarah. He is the avatar of the responsibility Sarah needs to obtain and atone for losing. And responsibility is gender neutral. Where Toby becomes more than a MacGuffin is with Jareth. There he takes more a form of how toxic masculinity harms men. Oh, he's a lively little chap. I think I'll call him Jareth. He's got my eyes. Jareth is trying to mold Toby into a version of himself without care as to what Toby might want or need. Patriarchy is the rule of fathers, after all. Sons are treated just as carelessly, just in different ways. How Jareth treats Sarah is remarkable as well. Jareth and Toggle under his influence infantilize Sarah. They treat her like a little girl, less capable. Her delicate sensibilities would surely be overwhelmed by the magnitude of her task. Jareth toys with her, doesn't take her seriously, and even when Hoggle warms up to her in the oubliette, he speaks to her in a paternalistic, doting way that underestimates her. Not only does this fit the coming-of-age narrative in that every obstacle tries to keep that age from coming, but also in how women are so often infantilized and underestimated in modern culture. Teenage girls, most of all. But Sarah does not put up with these indignities. She is content with nothing less than victory. And her victory amounts to rejecting the negative influence of an older male authority figure. When Sarah says the words, you have no power over me, she is winning by smashing the literal patriarchy. You have no power over me is an assertion of Sarah's own autonomy that Jareth only has as much power over her as she allows. She has always had that power, but it took her rebirth through the labyrinth to understand it. Understanding our own autonomy is a key component to growing up. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. With that realization in place, Jareth is nothing more than a paper tiger. All this bluster and bones amounts to... So, where does that leave Jareth? It's a question over 30 years of fanfic has been trying to answer. Was it a ruse to buy Jareth time? Was it a test of Sarah's fortitude? Is Jareth a possessive, rapey villain? Or lost, love-struck tragedy? My answer is that it really doesn't matter. Jareth could have been completely sincere in his love and devotion to Sarah, but a massive power imbalance would still remain. She's still a teenager, and he's still ageless. She's still an American, not even old enough to vote, and he's a monarch. There cannot be a safe, healthy relationship built on such an uneven foundation, so the foundation must be destroyed. Fear me, love me, do as I say, and I will be your slave? Sounds like possession. My will is as strong as yours, and my kingdom as great leaves an opening for a true partnership. But more important is you have no power over me. Because she was never here for you, Jareth. She's here for the child that was stolen. She is here to fix her mistakes. She is here to take up the crown of her own throne. She is here for what is hers by right, and she is here for victory. In times of fear and despair, the message of Labyrinth is an essential one. The kings and goblins of this world don't want us to win. The odds are stacked against us, and seeing the full scope of all we have to accomplish makes it seem overwhelming. But victory is always at our hands and in our own minds. It starts in our very souls and was with us from the beginning. It might take a labyrinth's worth of time to remember that line, but that's okay. It might take a labyrinth's worth of challenges to remember that we mean that line, and that's okay. Use your right words. You have no power over me. And they don't. They don't have power over your mind or your resolve or your self-worth. The Goblin Kings don't want us to know that because that's the source of their power. You can revoke it from them. Remember, fan cubs, if you remember nothing else, know this. Our will is as strong, and our kingdom is great. 
And I pray we can all tell the goblins where the power truly lies. Thanks so much for watching. This has been a passion project for me for quite some time, obviously, and I'm so excited to put it out there for y'all. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, please. Put your comments down below. What did you think? What do you think of Labyrinth? Also, be sure to consider Patreon. I post things on there sometimes, previews, sketches, as well as my husband. Just a little bit of the month helps us keep the lights on. As always, fan cubs, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, thanks for listening. And if you didn't, I look forward to your flames. <laughs>